right, thanks, Johnny. If you haven't done so already, you can pull out your phone and check in at Paradigm Bible Studies, what I'm doing right now, and a suggested status line for tonight, which should really summarize, it's kind of the message in a nutshell, the message in a nugget is everything is scubalon. Say scubalon. Now, that's an interesting word, which we'll get to in just a little while. Everything is scubalon compared to Christ. And scubalon is the transliteration of a New Testament word, a Greek word, which means, well, it kind of sounds like what it means. I just stepped in some scubalon, right? So what do you think it means? Yeah, poof. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yes. I think the uh, technical term is excrement. It's a very graphic Bible word. It's only used once in the Bible, and we're going to come to the passage tonight where it's used. Everything is scubalon compared to knowing Christ. I was thinking about, you know, maybe using uh, another one. No, I'm not going to even say it. I'm not going to even say it. It would get me in trouble. So a couple of things before we jump in tonight. You can put whatever you want to on the status. I just think it's cool to check in, let people know where you're at on Thursday night, kind of what, what, what's important to you. A couple of things when we jump in into our Indestructible Joy series through the book of Philippians is um, an opportunity for this summer that has fairly recently um, come to the surface within our church. And I want to let you know about it. And you can begin to think about it, pray about it, or maybe you know somebody that might be interested in it. You can pass it along. There is a former college pastor in Lubbock. His name's Keith Baldridge. Anybody know Keith? Keith's a solid dude. He and his family and others, a team, are planting a church in a community outside of Denver, Colorado. And they are looking for some help, right? So they're just starting from the ground up. And um, they just moved there uh, recently, a few months ago, and starting this church called The Living Stone. So you could pull up their website, thelivingstone.church, and check out this church. But here's the deal. Our, our church here, First Baptist Lubbock, is sponsoring two summer interns for them. And so if you're interested, there's, there's lots of flexibility in the time. Uh, so you go up, help this church plant get kind of traction, get off the ground. Um, you could spend three weeks, four weeks, uh, and even the time frame of the summer, there's some flexibility. There, a, a part of that job is going to be interacting with the community, just letting people know about the church, but also helping to host mission teams. Cool? I mean, Denver, I think, in, I just read an article a couple weeks ago that Denver's supposed to be the number one city uh, to live in America, apparently. I don't know what, how they determined that. I don't know how Lubbock miss, missed the mark, <laughs> but Denver, whatever, Rocky Mountains. Uh, so if you want to spend um, part of your summer doing something significant, uh, come talk to me, email me, text me, find me on Facebook. Um, we're going to be doing some interviews in the weeks follow after spring break. Spe speaking of spring break, one other thing before we jump back into the book of Philippians is we got a couple of busloads of students from our ministry going to South Texas. We're leaving on Sunday morning. And so, yeah, it's awesome. And there's other uh, mission teams, mission trips going from other churches and other ministries around our campus, around our community. And so what I want to do now is just take a minute to pray. Is that cool if we just prayed for the, all the mission efforts that are going on over spring break? Um, and so, and you get, some of you guys are going home. Some of you guys are going on vacation. That's cool. Enjoy that. We'll pray for you guys to have a safe time as well. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you for tonight. And thank you for drawing this specific crowd here tonight to hear from your word. And we pray for next week, God. Uh, we look ahead and pray for this mission trip that we'll get to be a part of. Many of us in this room tonight will get to be a part of. I pray you'll do great things in our life and through our life. I pray, God, that we'll prepare our hearts in the next few days as we get on that bus on Sunday and drive 12 hours south and that we could be your hands and feet. We could be your embrace to people that we come into contact with. I pray for the other mission trips and mission teams that are happening around our campuses and around our community. God, I pray that you would empower them, use them, go before them. God, that all these teams that are representing you all over the world would shine bright with your love. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Let's turn to book of Philippians chapter three. Philippians chapter three. And we're gonna read a chunk of scripture then I'll come back and kind of break it down and slice it and dice it. So Philippians chapter three, beginning in verse one. Further, my brothers and sisters, 
Rejoice in the Lord. All right, so there he is. Right out the, what's the theme of the book of Philippians? Joy. So the, the title of the sermon series is Indestructible Joy. Nobody can take it, but you sure can give it away. And he says right out of the gate here. I mean, so further, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same thing to you again. It is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs. Okay, so we had a pretty radical shift right there. All right, so you have the Apostle Paul, and we didn't read this last week, but kind of flowing out of the, the last part of chapter two, you have two of his amigos in ministry. You have Timothy and Epaphroditus, and he's just sharing his heart about these two brothers, these partners in ministry, how much they mean to him. And he's writing to the church in Philippi saying, receive them warmly, honor them, because they serve the Lord with me on the front lines, making sacrifices. And then he goes, rejoice in the Lord, and then watch out for these dogs. So he makes a hard right here. And we're going to talk about in a minute that what is, what is he, Paul so fired up about? I mean, why is Paul so outraged? Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. So what you're about to get here is a religious resume, a pretty stellar religious resume. When he says, hey, if you wanna boast about working your way to heaven, a works-based faith, if you wanna kinda of compare religious trophies, then here, I think I, I could st go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody. Circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. That's a pretty strong statement for a human being to make, right? He has, a, the Apostle Paul, what was his name before he became the Apostle Paul? Saul of, where do he live? Tarsus, right? Saul of Tarsus was the most devoted religious dude I think you could ever run into. I mean, he was an extremist, right? He, was, he took things to the extreme. And he's saying, if I couldn't work my way to heaven, then nobody can. But whatever were gains to me, but whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything, say everything. You need to underline that in your Bible or circle it. Everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. Again, underline, circle, all things. I consider them, here's our word. What does your translation say? I consider them filth. I consider them, another word, rubbish, rubbish, that's rubbish. <laughs> Rubbish. Uh, so I feel like I should say that with an English accent. I consider them garbage. I consider them, here it is, scubalon. Now that's a graphic word. We're going to come back to that in a minute. The Apostle Paul, he didn't have to be that graphic in his language. But he says, I consider all these things that I once lived for, I now consider them scubalon that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ, yes, the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. So here's the sermon in a nugget right here. Our greatest accomplishments, your greatest accomplishments and achievements, your highest achievements, your greatest accomplishments are scubalon compared to Christ. They are nothing, they're garbage compared to knowing Christ Jesus. So let's see how this works here. And we've already seen this throughout the book. Paul, the apostle Paul has this, this consuming passion you remember from chapter one when he says, hey, I'd rather die and be with Jesus. 
I mean, honestly, if you gave me a choice right now, if I look out at my future and my future marriage and my future spouse and my future honeymoon and my future job and my future kids and my future whatever, career, you know, the white picket fence, the whole nine yards, three bedroom, two bath, the American dream. If I look at all of that, all of that, y'all, he's saying now, he's clarifying a little bit more, saying all of that is scubalon compared to Jesus. Now, is that bad? This stuff isn't bad, right? I hope not, because <laughs> I have a lot of it right now, right? But he's saying, when you look at all the things that we desire, all the things that we live for, all the things that drive our life, Jesus is so much greater that it looks like all these things look like scubalon compared to the passion that we should have for Jesus, for Christ. And he says here, right out the gate, he says, I'm gonna remind you of some things. How many of you guys have like a photographic memory? Anybody? All right. We, uh, I'm, I'm a little jealous of the photographic memory because how many of y'all are more on the other end of the memory spectrum, right? Yeah, right, that's me too, right? So I need reminding, right? Some of y'all need reminding regularly, right? About, hey, you need to go to class. Hey, it's Thursday, right? Eight o'clock. We need reminding about, hey, you got an assignment tomorrow. You got an exam tomorrow. Some of y'all were like, you just hit you like a lightning bolt. Oh, he's right. <laughs> so, the Apostle Paul saying, I'm going to remind you about things that really matter. He said, it's for your safety. It's, it's for your good. And so here's the deal. We constantly need reminding about what ultimately matters. Am I the only one? Am I the only one that gets distracted by lesser things? Not evil things, hopefully, but lesser things. Am I the only one that needs to regularly, consistently come to a place and have somebody, a preacher, a friend, a brother, a sister say, hey, How's your walk with God? I need constant reminding. And he says, I'm gonna go back to the gospel. So you never grow outgrow the gospel. You never graduate from the gospel. That's why I think, I mean, every ministry, every church, we need to regular, we need to consistently include the gospel, right? In everything that we do, we should be gospel flavored because we all need reminding because we all have a tendency to slip back into Saul of Tarsus mode, legalist mode. I don't know about you, so you, you're out the gate, you're like, oh, I'm saved by grace, oh, I'm so thankful. But then all of a sudden, a week later, a month later, we start thinking that we're doing it. It's my devotion, it's my discipline, it's my strength, it's my resources, it's my skills, it's my gifts, it's my fill in the blank. And so we need to be constantly reminded we never stop needing the gospel. We have to regularly set our hearts to gospel mode. And so then Paul gets super fired up here, right? He gets outraged. There's like this outburst. Those dogs, those mongrels, those evildoers. This, is, God, this doesn't come across in, in the English translations, but to the original audience, they're like, ooh, I know he didn't. Did he just... Because these are strong words, y'all. He's, he's not just saying, well, there's some people, there's, there's, a, there's some people in the neighborhood that aren't very nice, so, you know, be on the lookout. No, he's not. He's saying there's some dogs prowling around. There's evildoers. There's mutilators of the flesh. So Paul gets super fired up. He goes from talking about his friends and rejoicing, and then he lowers the boom on another group here. So who are these people that makes Paul so angry? They're called Judaizers. Go ahead and say it, Judaizers. That's right. Here's what would happen, y'all. So the apostle Paul would roll into Philippi, right? And he'd tell them about Jesus. He'd start a church and people would respond to the gospel. The Holy Spirit would come in and people would be saved. The church would get started and they're moving along nicely. And then Paul would say, okay, chest bump, high five. I'm gonna go over here to Galatia. I gotta go over here to Corinth. I gotta go check in on some other churches, go start some other churches. So remember what I told you, okay? I spent a long time, day after day, reminding, reminding. You know, he's told him all these things in person. Now he's reminding him in his letter. So he would go over here, and then guess who would come in? 
who would come in the back door. So here's the dogs, right? Here's the Judaizers. They come in right here and they tell the church in Philippi, they say, hey, you know what that dude told you? He's right, right? Jesus did come to save your soul. He's the son of God, but you have to become a Jew before you become a Christian. So here, hey, you, you Philippians, you guys are remedial Christians, basically. They'd come in and say, you guys are 099 followers of God. He said, if you really want to step up your game, if you want to be a graduate level follower of God, then here's what you got to do. You got to be circumcised, All right? So you got, basically, you have to become a Jew in order to really be a good Christian. And so the apostle Paul, he, he saw this. And by the way, this is not the only church that they came in and were trying to twist the gospel message. So here it was, it was Jesus plus something equals salvation. So that's what the, the apostle Paul got so fired up because he came in, he laid the foundation. It was the pure gospel saying it was by grace alone, through faith alone and Christ alone, Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. Right? We access what God has done through faith. And these other people would come in and twist it. They would twist it. And Paul got a little angry. He got a little mad. It was a subtle corruption, but it changed the gospel. And I think we all have a tendency to go into Jesus plus mode. Are you the only one? Come on. Jesus plus mode, right? We all need to be regularly reminded of the gospel. We all have a tendency, I think, to categorize our faith and the faith of others. That dude over there is definitely a remedial Christian because <laughs> he doesn't listen to air one. You know what I'm saying? That sister over there, she might be a 101 Christian because I've seen her with the Christian t-shirts on. You know, so she's getting there, right? Homeboy over there is definitely, I don't even know if he's a remedial Christian because he listens to secular music. Right, you just, the list goes on and on here, right? right? The list goes on and on. So here are some things, some common things that, that we need to keep in check all the time. It's Jesus plus fill in the blank. We're, we're, we're built to be enticed by some new and improved brand of Christianity. That's what the Judaizers were saying. Hey, the apostle Paul gave you the 1.0 version. Here comes 2.0 right here. Here's the upgrade, right? And so we're always tempted to look at this new and improved version of Christianity. And the first one is this, Jesus plus experience. And so some people will tell you, maybe people close to you, maybe even your family, the place you come from, is you gotta have this experience in order to be really close to God. And some of my charismatic brothers and sisters are in danger of walking, of falling into this trap, right? So you got to speak in tongues if you're going to be a, if you're going to be a PhD, PhD level Christian, man, if you're going to be a graduate level follower of God, oh, you haven't spoken in tongues yet, then you're just an 099 Christian, right? Oh, you, you're, you're a remedial follower of Christ. You're just in a 101 class. And all of these I'm about to mention, I'm not just picking on uh, the charismatic brothers and sisters because they could teach us a thing or two about getting a little more excited about God, okay? We, we can learn things from them, from each other. But the danger in that is I gotta have an experience. And how many of y'all are seeking the next emotional high? How many of you guys are seeking the next mountaintop experience? I gotta feel something from God. So it's Jesus plus, plus emotion for you. There was groups back in the day called the Gnostics that believed you had to have this special experience, this secret ceremony that provided this special knowledge. And so the experienced crowd will look at you and say, you need to be more spiritual. There's another group, okay? And this is the way they kind of modify the gospel. And I think all of us have a tendency, I think all of us, because of how we're just designed are gonna be in more danger of one or one or the other of these. The next one is, the first one is be more spiritual, Jesus plus experience. The second one is Jesus plus knowledge. You gotta be more academic. So you gotta study more. And some of my reformed brothers or sisters have a tendency to be in danger of falling into this trap. 
You, oh, man, oh, you haven't read Jonathan Edwards? You don't know who Charles Haddon Spurgeon is? You got to be an 099, you know what I'm saying? I mean, we may not say it like that, but that's what we're thinking. And then we walk away and we got a little spiritual swagger going on because we're feeling like, okay, I thought I was in 101, but if that dude's 099, then I got to be at least a 401, right? And we feel good about ourselves. Oh, man, I, I've had this amazing emotional experience. I was filled with the Holy Ghost. And then you, you walk up to someone that maybe doesn't have that emotional part of their testimony, that experiential part, and you walk away with a little swagger thinking, well, God, I must, I must be God's favorite. And then this other group with the knowledge is Jesus plus knowledge leads to scholasticism, which means you've you got to have this special learning to get things from God, follow certain teachers and certain doctrines. There's an intellectual hierarchy. So this group says be more academic. The third group, the third group I think all of us struggle with at some, at some times in our, in our journey is Jesus plus behavior, right? So this is the moralistic movement. You have the charismatic movement, the reform movement and the moralistic movement. Right, the moralistic movement says, be a better person. So you need Jesus plus fill in the blank. Jesus plus clean up your vocabulary. All right, don't we do that? Jesus plus stop drinking alcohol. All right. Do we do that? I mean, do you know people that do that at least? Jesus plus listen to certain kind of music, dressing in certain kinds of way. And it could even be this, Jesus plus baptism, Jesus plus Bible reading, Jesus plus tithing. It's Jesus plus nothing. Now, don't get me wrong, listen to me now. These things aren't inherently bad. As a matter of fact, a lot of these things are good. I hope to feel something from God through the Holy Spirit. I hope to grow in my knowledge of God. I, I hope uh, to, for my life to be changed and for my behavior to reflect my faith more and more. But if I'm banking on those things, getting me a gold star by my name in heaven and somehow I'm earning a ticket into heaven, then it becomes evil. Then it becomes evil. And that's why Paul gets so fired up. So our deal, I mean, most, hopefully our deal isn't circumcision, right? That was a big deal back in the day, by the way. And I won't go into that, but it was a big deal back in the day. And that's, that's kind of weird to us, but that was a huge deal. I need to ask, what is the huge deal for us? What are, what are people trying to add to the gospel? What is the new and improved version of Jesus that's being presented to you? the enhanced version of salvation. Oh, you know, you heard that when you were a kid in vacation Bible school, Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so. But let me tell you how you're gonna take another step, right? Where you're gonna be a 2.0 Christian. You're gonna be a graduate level Christian. So you, also, you always gotta be on the guard because sometimes it happens very subtly. So these things aren't intrinsically bad. Like I said, I need to go back and say that. But as Jesus plus Nothing. We access salvation through faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone. So he says there, he has no confidence in the flesh, no confidence in our efforts to earn heaven. The gospel should crush our pride. All these other groups have a tendency to create the opposite, right? Jesus plus experience, Jesus plus knowledge, Jesus plus behavior, it creates a swagger. You ever met somebody before? Which is the antithesis of the heart of Christ. Somebody that has their chest poked out and they're feeling pretty good about themselves because they know a thing or two about God, right? The creator of the universe, right? That we've studied God a little bit and we feel like we know a thing or two about who God is. We've read a few preachers or commentators or theologians. One of the surest signs that you're on the right track is humility. When you're in the presence of the other, capital O, when you're in, in the presence of the one true God, the one creator of all things. So whenever you encounter the swagger in your own life or in somebody else's life, you need to be on guard. So it's our temptation to boast in our efforts and our achievements, but we have to constantly turn the spotlight back to Jesus. And Paul uses his life as exhibit A of this. He says, I once did this, but now I'm over here. He talks about rituals and traditions. 
Perhaps some of us were baptized as an infant. Some of you might have been baptized as an infant. Maybe you had first communion. You were dedicated as a baby. You were, you were baptized in vacation Bible school. You did Bible drill. You went to youth camp. You've been on mission trips. Whatever it might be. If you're, those things are good. But if you're banking on those things to be on a religious resume that you're going to hand to God at the gates of heaven and expect him to be impressed, then these things that are good can turn around and become evil. Family and heritage. Some of us, to, you might bank on the faith of your family. Because the apostle Paul, he, man, he, in other places, he is a Pharisee and the son of a Pharisee of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. So he had the lineage, right? He had that kind of, he had that ancestry.com thing going for him. Lots of super solid people in his family that followed God. And some of y'all might be thinking, well, my grandfather was a preacher. My uncle is a deacon. My dad is a Sunday school teacher. My mom led vacation Bible school. And you think that somehow you're going to be righteous by association. Doesn't happen. Right? So you can't boast in the rituals and traditions that you were raised in. You can't boast in your family or your heritage. You can't boast in the rules and regu regulations that you tried to keep. Paul said he's an extreme rule keeper. He had a morally superior lifestyle. And this might be where some of us, some of us, some of y'all were just good, like good kids. And that's awesome, man. I envy that testimony. But you gotta be careful here, y'all, because that's what he's saying, right? He's saying as a Pharisee, I felt good about myself because I had a morally superior lifestyle, right? And he was banking on that right, to, to earn him brownie points with God. To say, look at me on the holy hill. Look how hard I've worked. Look at these religious calluses on my hands, God. I'm better than most people, therefore I deserve to be in heaven. Now that's not the gospel. Because some, some of y'all were like, and? <laughs> yeah, right, you know. The Bible says that, doesn't it? <laughs> Negative. The Bible says the opposite. Here's the crazy part, y'all. If I were to walk out on the campus, if I were just three blocks away, and I were to kind of just interview people. Who's the weird old bearded guy like on campus interviewing people? Oh, it's just my university pastor. Don't worry about him. And I were to say, hey, what's up? My name's John. How's it going? Where are you from? I go through the same conversation a thousand times. Where are you from? Oh, cool. You know, how long you been here? Oh, awesome. Cool. Freshman. I love freshmen. That's awesome. And I, what's your major, right? And then I'd come around to, hey, listen, I'm just out here trying to get a feel for the spiritual climate of, of our campus. Um, tell me something. Were you raised in church? Um, did you go to church growing up? I think a lot of students, especially if they knew who I was, right, uh, would say, yeah, I went to church. I went to the Methodist church down the road or my grandma picked me up or my, you know, I went with a friend, a youth group, whatever, right? I went to v uh, vacation Bible school and I would ask him this question. Okay, tell me something. How do you get into heaven? I just kind of go, man, let's just kind of cut through all the other stuff and just go straight for it. How do you get into heaven? Here's the deal. The majority of people in my experience and even in the studies that I've read, they would say this, be a what? good person. Be a good person, right? Right. And y'all are thinking, yeah. Uh, some of y'all in here even might be thinking, yeah. The largest study that's ever been done of the religious life of teenagers happened back in 2000 something. It was 2010-ish, right? And they, and they did the exit interview. And this is across denominational lines, right? And they, and they asked them that question. And that was their response. So here's the deal. We have students that are coming through our children's ministries. We have students that are coming through our youth ministries and they're walking out the door, stepping onto a college campus and you ask them, what is the gospel? And they say, I just, you know, just to be a better person. You know, what, what, how has God helped you? He helps me be a better person. How do you get into heaven? You be a good person. And guess what? The crazy part is, y'all, that is the exact opposite of what the Bible says is the gospel. The Bible says there is no one righteous, no, not one. And the apostle Paul said, if anybody could have ever earned their way into heaven, it was me. Because I had all the trophies on the shelf. I had all the gold stars by my name. I had all the patches, right? All the pins. He'd, he'd done it all. And he wasn't going to make it in. 
No one righteous. No, not one. That's what makes the gospel good news is that Jesus came to live a life that we should have lived and he died the death that we should have died. So it's his perfection. Right, here's the big word that gets imputed. Oh, there you go. It gets transferred, right? It's his righteousness. That's what he, it's, it's a righteousness that is from God, not from your hometown, not from your church, not from your peer preacher, not from your family, not from your good deeds and your moral lifestyle. A righteousness that is from God and is by faith. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Paul was banking on his religious resume to get him into heaven. And then he had this emergency break moment in his journey when everything changed. That's what he says here in Philippians 3. All of a sudden, you kind of, you hit something happened to him that radically changed the direction of his life. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them scubalon, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. He's saying, I once valued these things. I once lived for these things. My identity, I once found my identity in these things, but now I value Christ. Now I find my identity in Christ. Now I live for Christ. So that there was this life-changing moment on the Damascus road. You can go back in Acts chapter nine and actually read about it. When the apostle Paul was seized by the Holy Spirit and captured by Christ. And he goes into this salvation manifesto here. He mentions Christ nine times in the next five verses. And it builds, right? It's progressive. There's a progression of the strength of the language as he pours out his heart. Whatever was to my prophet, he said he's referring to that list, the Hebrew of Hebrews, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee, blameless, he says he was. And then he says everything, so he broadens it. And then he says, I have lost all things. So he, reinf- he really wants y'all to get this. He wants us to get this. I consider everything scubalon. Now, is he just being overly dr- dramatic for effect? Right? Because this is like a PG-13 sermon back in the day. You know, in the, in, the, in, the, in the original audience, you know, when they're reading the letter to the church and they come to that part, they try to soften it because it's vulgar. (laughs) That's what he's saying. The apostle Paul, man, he's in full, like his heart is full. He's pouring it out. And he's saying, everything that I once considered gain, man, my popularity, my career, my finances, my health, my family, everything that wasn't intrinsically bad, but compared to what he had discovered in Christ Jesus, it was a big steaming pile of scubalon. Now that's, that's vulgar, that's graphic, that's kind of gross. But he meant it because his life backed up what he was saying. Lost all things. So this is, uh, one commentator said, the vulgarity of the term is deliberate as Paul wants to strike us with the worthlessness of life apart from Jesus. It's the shock value when he throws out scubalon. So he, he really means it a righteousness that comes from God and is accessed by faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift. Say gift, the gift of God. Salvation is a gift. And some of y'all are like, well, don't I have to buy the gift? Wait, wait, wait. If I bought a gift for myself, could I call that a gift? Or would that just be a purchase? <laughs> you know what? My student loan check just came in. I'm gonna go get, buy myself some gifts. That's a gift. And the gift is salvation. It was purchased by God through the blood of his son. It's the ultimate gift. God paid the ultimate price for the ultimate gift. Now it's us that must receive it and open it. And through faith, we receive the gift and experience the life-changing presence of Jesus. 
So we don't, here it is, let's wrap this up. We don't all have a radical conversion. So the apostle Paul had this 180. He had this Damascus road. I mean, boom, lightning struck from heaven, knocked him off his horse and Jesus talked to him, right? So that's a pretty amazing testimony. But here's the deal. Some of y'all are already excusing yourself because, hey, bro, that is the apostle Paul. He's like the best Christian that's ever lived, right? But he's talking to, listen, he's talking to the Philippians who are just regular Christians like me and you. We're just struggling to make it, right? We're dog paddling in the deep end, right? Just for the Philippians, just like that, man, they're trying to pay the bills. They're trying, man, there's not enough hours in the day. They're just trying their best to live for God. And the apostle Paul is saying, listen, I'm not, some, I'm not some spiritual superstar here. I'm not Captain Christian, right? They come in to save the day. He said, every one of us should have this this attitude towards our faith. And this is what we need, y'all. We, need it. we don't need another Christian concert. We don't need another ministry specialist. We don't need another huge building with steeples. We don't need another, another conference, another event. We've, we have more of those now than ever before in the history of Christianity. What we need is for you and for me to begin to live out what the Apostle Paul is teaching in the book of Philippians, to have an all-consuming passion for Jesus where everything else in our lives is scuba line compared to the love and devotion and commitment that we have to Christ. So we don't all have a radical conversion, but we're all called to have the same radical change. It's a radical shift in our values. Paul describes, one commentator says, the total reorientation of his life because of Jesus. A total reorientation. Not like, you know what, I think I'll go, some, I'll go to that worship thing on Thursday night. You know what, I think I'm gonna, you know, I think I'm gonna go to church every now and again. No, when you meet Jesus, the apostle Paul's saying, hey, the circumstances are different, but the result is the same and it's transformation, y'all is transformation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has come. This is what the church needs. This is what the church needs, y'all. We need a depth of conviction that produces a vibrant faith that illuminates our life. I'm not talking about religious wackos, right? Where you're just walking around, ah! I'm gonna shave my head and wear a robe. No, I'm not talking about just, I'm talking about a, a normal person that's going to class that is lit up with Jesus Christ, that their heart is full with the presence of God, so full that it overflows beyond the borders of their life and people around them feel the heat from the fire that's burning in their soul. That's what I'm talking about. And it's possible for that to describe you. Some of y'all already checked out saying, hey man, not a whole lot of burning going on in my soul, right? I'm just barely making it. No, I'm telling you, if you're barely making it, you're a prime candidate for exactly what the apostle Paul's saying because he's saying, I don't care how strong you are. I don't care how disciplined you are. I don't care how organized you are. None of that means nothing when it comes to Christ. He's saying it's because of Christ Jesus. And so you're a prime candidate for Christ to move in and shine bright through your broken life through my broken life. Let me conclude by asking a question. What is it that you truly treasure? What is it? I know if a preacher asks that, God, Jesus, but truly, think about this. Do some soul searching for the next few moments. As Johnny and the crew come back up here, just do some soul searching. I want you to wrestle with that question. What has surpassing value in your life? What is it? Is it school? Some of y'all, hey, listen, you're driven. You're academically driven. And if people were to observe your life for a little while, they'd say, that is a good student right there. Stellar student, valedictorian. Nothing wrong with that. But it does become wrong when it drives your life. Is it your reputation, your social circle? How many friends that you have on Twitter or Instagram? Does that drive your life? There's nothing wrong with social media, y'all, but it becomes wrong, it becomes bad when it defines us, when you're defined by that grade, when you're defined by your relationship status, y'all, when you're defined by some job offer or lack thereof. 
as a Christ follower, if someone were to observe your life for just a little while, I hope there would be enough evidence to convict me of being a Christian. Not just a good student, not just a nice person, not just a popular guy or a funny girl or whatever it might be for you. But I hope if somebody were to watch me for a while, they were to say, man, that dude is living for something greater than himself. Man, even if, even if you were to mute the tape, if all they could see were your actions and your expressions, if all they could see was, man, they're opening this book all the time and they have a vibrancy to their life, they have a radiance to their life, I really hope, man, that it's not just me because that's what we need. That's what our campus needs. Our campus doesn't need another ministry. We don't need another sermon. We need some of us to walk out of here lit up with Jesus so we can light up the night with his love. What do you truly treasure? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for the gospel. The gospel changes everything. It has for me and it can for anyone. And thank you for the example of the Apostle Paul. Wore himself out trying to earn the spot on your team and in the end it meant nothing. All that matters is you. So I pray you'll help us in these next few moments to do some soul searching, to ask the tough question of what really defines me? What drives me? What has surpassing value in my life? And if it's anything other than you, God, I pray right now we'd get that right. We'd repent of anything we put ahead of you. And we'd lay down any excuses that we're bringing to the table and say, God, if that's possible, if what that dude's talking about is possible, then I'm in. I'm in.